everyone. Welcome to Coffee Break. It's Steve Barrett here, the Editorial Director of PR Week. Delighted to be here with Ben LeBolt, who's a partner at Bully Pulpit Interactive. Going to chat a bit about public affairs work and a leave of absence Ben had recently. So welcome to the show, Ben. How are you doing? Great to be here. Doing well. I brought my Phil's uh, coffee in San Francisco this morning, so I'll be yeah. drinking it iced absolutely got to have your iced coffee especially in san francisco yeah there you go we had someone on recently with the biggest coffee cup in the world basically so you, you know you've got a bit of competition there but ben tell us about this leave of absence you were working on the K- katanji uh, brown jackson's um elevation to the supreme court um how does that work you know you, you took a leave of absence and you were working on comms around that tell us a bit about it we'd love to hear it that's right. So this this was actually the third Supreme Court nomination process that I participated in. I was on the confirmation teams for Justices Sotomayor and, and Justice Kagan um, about a decade ago when I was working at the White House. And I was just riding my bike in, in San Francisco and in late January had seen the news about the vacancy on the Supreme Court um, and thought, you know, maybe I'll write a quick memo to folks who are on the current team and and just share some ideas from how we did it 10 years ago. And instead, I got a call um, from the White House counsel, Dana Remus, asking if uh, I could come to, to D.C. for two or three months and and advise the team on um, communications. Um, and and look, we approached this um, like you would uh, a campaign um, and on political campaigns, um, you rank um sort of each individual that has a vote and here there were a hundred votes in the senate in in campaigns you rank uh voters based on a scale of one to five one is they're definitely with you five is they're definitely against you and you spend most of your resources and time on the persuadables the twos threes and fours and so we knew um the path to victory um was really focusing on those persuadable senators uh moderate democrats and and republicans um, senators like Senator Manchin, Cinema, Collins, Romney, uh, and and Murkowski, and so we really focused um, our messaging effort um, and our press effort um, on on reaching those senators and making sure their concerns with who the next justice on the court would be um, were addressed through those communications, both in one on one meetings and in external communications through the press. How's that changed in the decade? It, it's a very difficult different political environment isn't it and uh, it's a great big reflection on having done it you know a decade apart what what were the biggest changes and how do you appeal to more moderate voices on both sides because it just seems we're a bit it's a bit febrile at the moment the whole process isn't it yeah no i I think that's right look it's it's a hardened partisan environment um you know and the process has changed over the years um, look, Justice Scalia, uh, a couple of decades ago, was confirmed with 98 to zero uh, support in the Senate and, and somebody who certainly was considered uh, an ideologue. Uh, we had over 60 votes uh, in the Senate for Justices Sotomayor and, and Kagan. And so you had about 10 plus persuadable Republicans at that time. I think it's a little bit different uh, after the Trump uh, era. Uh, the country is is more polarized. Um, and there's concerns in, in the Republican base about um, getting through um, their primaries if, if they don't take a hard line and a, a Trump aligned uh, position. And so we started this process with fewer persuadables um, than uh, perhaps we had uh, a decade ago. But still, we, we learned uh, from those processes and, and we used, um, you know, some of the same uh, tactics first. Uh, We started with uh, very, very deep uh, briefing books on the nominees and potential nominees. We had materials on um, all the leading candidates who might be selected. And and I got to the White House about a month before uh, the nomination of of Judge Jackson was announced to review those materials, prepare messaging and a narrative around each one of them. I think it's important to talk both about their qualifications um, and their life story to get to know them um, as a human being. A lot of judges are sort of closed off, um, not known as warm, engaging people because you just hear about their rulings. You don't hear from their family. Um, you don't hear about their life story. And so uh, in this case, we made sure there was a combination of both of those aspects. You know, the judges' college roommates were out there doing 
segments on Good Morning America at the same time as we were working with Supreme Court reporters to review the judge's eight year um, history of, of sitting um, on the bench. We were using the intelligence that um, Senator Jones and others were getting from meetings on Capitol Hill to incorporate in our communications to hear about what are the priorities for Senator Collins? What are the priorities for Senator Manchin? Um, how can we communicate to them through the press to show that this is a fair and impartial judge who's well qualified for the position? And so um, the number of persuadables may have been smaller um, this time around, but I think a lot of folks had worked in the Obama administration, had been through this process before. And so we took the learnings from that experience to this one. And what were a couple of highlights from the whole process for you or, or significant points that you, you really that really stood out? I remember one picture that said a lot, I think, to a lot of people was the great picture of Judge Jackson with her daughter in the background looking so proud and her husband also being there and very supportive. That seemed to say so much, just one picture, you know, that really summed up uh, just a feeling. But, but what were the highlights for you? It did look at, you know, I spent a lot of time in the preparation process for the hearing with, with the White House Counsel's Office and the broader confirmation team, you know, working with the judge to prepare her for what this moment would be like. And, and she told me, look, I grew up in Miami, but I studied every day to get to where I am. You know, I didn't party. I didn't go to the beach. Uh, you know, I've been studying for this, this position for a long time. And so she was very well prepared on constitutional law. She'd been a judge for eight years. She was prepared for those sorts of questions. But what you also have to prepare the nominee for is a bit of the, the political circus uh, around these processes. Um, the stories um, that would uh, be placed at, at Fox News, opposition research that the Republican National Committee was sending out, letters to the editor that she wrote, um, decades ago, everything that happened at Harvard University during the time she was there, she could be asked about, right? And so you have to prepare somebody who's not an elected official, not a CEO, um, is very familiar with their judicial record for the press environment and the political environment. Um, and, you know, that, that takes some extra time because these nominees have not really been um, through that process to the same extent before. Now, she'd been up for other judgeships. She'd been confirmed by the Senate before. And so I think that was helpful to her. Um, and, and one of the reasons the president wanted to select someone who'd been through this process before. Yeah, I'm just so glad they didn't have social media when I was at university. So I'm just going to leave it there. But it's like, because <laughs> you're, you're quite young and you, you do make mistakes. Uh, let's just put it that way. But uh, do you have a view on the uh, Huawei? We've got you on Elon Musk potentially taking over Twitter. What, what's your take on that story? It's been big this week. Um, look, it, it's, uh, it's certainly um, a huge topic uh, for folks out here um, in the Bay Area and, and across the country. Um, you know, having worked for a number of, of tech companies before, I think he'll find as CEO that it's a very complex endeavor with tough choices that need to be made every single day. And the lines uh, of going one way or another on those choices are pretty great. Um, it takes a very smart team of policy folks, um, lawyers, uh, communicators, uh, folks with relationships on, on Capitol Hill and with regulators, uh, multiple markets you have to think about, particularly the United States and the EU and how those regulators and policymakers uh, will interact. And so I think this won't just be, um, you know, a platform in which it's easy to lay out a general principle and then just stick to that over time. I think there's going to be a bunch of complex decisions and it will be a very difficult endeavor to run uh, day to day. And I think the complexity of the challenge will be obvious um, when he when he uh, completes the the takeover of the company. Yeah, loads of hurdles to get over, like you said, all around the world and uh, a long way twixt cup and lip, as they say. But uh, one thing that struck me was where he said it, it's like the town hall. It's the town square where all big uh, subjects get discussed. And if if. I guess that's where you've kind of hung out, you know, the town square or whatever, where you're trying to influence opinion over the years. You worked on the Obama campaign, famously using digital tactics, which were quite innovative at the time and, and which you've brought now into a, you know, a corporate environment as well as staying in politics. 
it it is a, a bit of a, a toxic environment as well and do you th how much do you think social media has influenced the, the the way politics has gone and 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 the way it's become so partisan because i think a lot of people just want a bit more of they just want a bit a bit more normality or what what we used to think of as normality where you can still have friends or talk to people who might not agree with you politically but that doesn't mean you have to hate them you know it just seems to have gone a little bit too far well look i think like like any other major issue um there are amazing wonderful things that have come out of the advent of, of social media and the growth of digital um, and then there are some unintended consequences along the way that that need to be dealt with. And so um, I think it's democratized uh, the media and the points of view uh, we have. You know, it's not just three networks and three major print sources uh, that are the authorities uh, for the world uh, anymore. And, and look, they used to be mainly shaped from the point of view of, of white men. And so there's been a diversification of voices that I think is healthy you would have seen many more establishment candidates run and win over the years based on their name ID alone without the advent of, of social media. And so I don't think something like the Obama campaign would have been possible without um, the growth of digital media and, and the advent of, of social media. Um, but platforms have a responsibility as well. And as the world becomes more interconnected, um, there's also opportunities for um, abuse. I mean, there are whole bureaus uh, in China and Russia dedicated to creating and, and spreading disinformation um, through uh, primarily um, social media, for example. And so, uh, you know, platforms need to, to institute um, teams that monitor these things, um, hire people with a security background, use both AI and, and human resources to go after these sorts of problems and, and be predictive about what the next challenge um, will look like as we move into um, Web3 um, and uh, a whole new iteration of, of the internet and the next wave of, of computing. They haven't always gotten ahead of the problems. They will often manage the problems after the fact, but, but hiring people that can see around corners, that can see the next challenge, that can predict uh, the problems that might arise from the changes in technology is essential. And just to finish up, how would how are you advising corporations and brands when they're operating in this environment? We we hear a lot of bit about purpose in business. There was the business roundtable statement, you know, three years ago. But you've got to and making statements on social issues. You know, we we see this with Disney and what they're dealing with in in Florida. It's so complicated. You've got diff you. Disney's customers span every single political stripe, don't they? So it's it's a difficult thing to do, but employees and and consumers do seem to want to know what brands stand for now. So what's the what would your top couple of pieces of advice be to them? Well, look, it's it's a high wire act, um, and you don't want to be seen as a brand that is just engaging in politics for uh, partisan purposes. Um, but consumers do have higher expectations of brands today in terms of their role in society, uh, how they impact the communities that they're involved in. And there are massive um, expectations from their workforces uh, in particular. You see that here in, in San Francisco in particular, where you have the culture of the weekly town hall um, and the entry level employee that can push back against the CEO with questions about how they're running the company and what issues they're weighing in on. Um, there are some issues that um, are sort of generally perceived as partisan by the media uh, that aren't really when you get down into the numbers. So for example, taking action on climate, you know, more than 66% um, of Americans um, support uh, a principle like that. And so I think there are some safe spaces to go for brands uh, to take action. And I think being on the side of um, inclusion, um, even if you get pushed back from some quarters is, is a good place to be. Uh, but each CEO needs to evaluate uh, their customer base, um, their brand purpose, um, and try to establish a set of core values that guide them um, through the headline shaping debates uh, that can serve as an anchor for what issues they weigh in on um, and what issues fall outside of that box that really don't have core relevance to the brand. Yeah, it's good advice. And uh, it's one of the reasons why PR agencies are booming and we're just about to release our agency report and it's going to show the, the sector they're up 20 percent so the demand for these services are 
is uh, is in good shape, which I guess is good news for you and all your colleagues in the industry. So thanks for joining us, Ben. Great to chat on the coffee break. Really appreciate it, Steve. Talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.